And Sandra says, well, send her in to me. I'll keep her busy. I've got plenty for her to do. So, so I get sent into RMIT TechniSearch and there I was filling out AA forms. Now, if people actually know what an AA form is, that means they've been in the sector about 30 years or more because that's the old ECOE. Yeah, and they wow. were in triplicate or whatever wow. and they were hand hand filled. G'day and welcome to Global Horizons. I'm your host, Rob Malicki, coming to you today from Wurundjeri country on the Kulin Nation in Melbourne. A great privilege to be in this part of the country. And I'm thrilled today to be joined by Melissa Banks, true legend of the oh, no. industry. And of course, she's going to say <laughs> no. But everybody that knows you, Melissa, has got so much respect. This is a great privilege for me. Thanks for joining me on Global Horizons. Well, welcome. Welcome to Melbourne. We've had the whole spectrum of Melbourne's infamous weather. <laughs> From really hot down to freezing outside today. It is pretty windy and cold, uh, oh, isn't it? <laughs> that's, it's only, only in Melbourne. Apparently, all the Bureau of Meteorology meteorologists come to study weather here in Melbourne because if you can predict Melbourne's weather, you can do it anywhere in the world. <laughs> do they know why? Is it because it's sort of like that, you know, kind of get those Antarctic weather uh, movements that kind of I come th- swirling up? Yeah, I think it's maritime weather. Mm. So you get... Whatever comes off the ocean and occasionally it blows across the land with the northerly winds. But you just get everything. Have you always been here? Did you start? I, I, here I've in always Melbourne? lived in Melbourne, but I've spent a lot of time, obviously, uh, travelling with work. And I've recently spent a lot of time down at Lakes Entrance on oh, in nice. East Gippsland on the 90 Mile Beach. Incredible. Yeah. So born and bred here? Or yes. did you grow up somewhere else? No, grew, grew up here, but... Out in the eastern suburbs. And, you know, when my parents bought their house, it was built for them. And we had dirt roads. And I can remember when the the roads were tarred and us running across it all day every, you know, and and finishing up the end of the day with all this tar stuck to our feet. So, of course, we had to go and jump in the pool, (laughs) the backyard pool, to get rid of this tar. And then mum and dad were furious (laughs) because we just (laughs) dirtied up the pool. (laughs) So a very suburban, ordinary upbringing. It must have changed so much since then, right? Because just like Melbourne is incredible the way that it's just growing out and out and out. Yeah, it tends to sprawl, um, yeah. which, you know, can be good and bad. There's plans. This government's got a lot of plans at the moment to go up that, rather than out. Yeah. Mm. We've been staying down on South Bank and, and uh, Dirk Mulder, with whom I've been staying we were just reflecting on how much that part has changed too. I mean, I remember the first time I came to Melbourne, it's not that long ago, maybe 20 years, and that was kind of like just an industrial wasteland. Like wasteland. Yes. And now it's this gleaming, thriving, thriving yes. hub of activity yes. and full of students, in fact. Yeah, lots of students yeah. and great multiculturalism. Yeah. Mm. And so you're just back from sabbatical. Why don't we start there? Yeah, why don't we? I see some of the stuff online, like on LinkedIn and stuff like that. I'm some like, of my photos. Yeah, good on you. <laughs> Which are only snapped with my iPhone. And my yeah. kids always tell me, stop taking the photos, mum. You're hopeless at it. <laughs> of course, children can be so yeah. positive and encouraging, can't they? <laughs> they reckon I, um, I, I do really take really bad photos and that they're always smudged or blurred or whatever because I move. So anyway, they are my photos. I've got a, a lot of them. I spent... 11 months all up, um, just reflecting and relaxing. Uh, When I left, my last job was Austrade, as you know, and I loved the experience of Austrade. Great team and um, fabulous people, uh, really great experience, but um, I could see what was coming. And I guess, you know, I didn't have the energy to work with that and I guess to be perfectly honest and you know what I'm like Rob (laughs) I think I would have struggled to look my friends and people from the sector in the eye and defend what was coming because I in my heart of hearts didn't necessarily agree and so that was going to compromise me ethically and so I made the decision that Probably now is a good time for a break as any. And just really enjoyed it. And (laughs) on reflection, I guess one of my big learnings, which is really very minor, um, potentially for people listening, was the art of strolling. Strolling? Strolling. 
So I had always been active and in my better days I would join the gym and I'd go to the gym and then I'd do a full day's work, come home, do kids and family activities and and duties and whatever. But, um, you know, as time gets more precious, you kind of think, well, I don't really have time to go to the gym because that's sort of 15 minutes driving, then you've got to shower and everything, 15 minutes back, blah, blah, blah. There's probably a better way to do this. So obviously walking, having dogs to... Makes, makes you walk with a purpose. You have to do it every day. But I always was sort of marching, I guess, from and striding from, from one A to B and back again and really not taking in the environment, which is a great shame. And so I actually didn't need to rush. And so I learned to take my time and I learned that stopping sort of halfway and sitting for a 15, 20 minutes, even half an hour, and just soaking up the sun and doing a little bit of mindfulness, I guess. And yeah, I suddenly realised, wow, you know, (laughs) it can be quite invigorating uh, just doing a stroll on the beach. And I I felt as though I was getting as many benefits out of that approach to my exercise every day as I would have through, you know, powering through a, a quick walk. Do you remember the moment where that sort of struck you? Do you remember where you were when suddenly you went, oh, hang on, like, have I, did you, and did you have that kind of like, oh, I've kind of been doing this for all this time? Just, and the reason I ask is because, like, when we did our trip around Australia, when we closed AIM overseas, I kind of had that moment too, where yes. suddenly I went, oh. Oh, ding. <laughs> yeah, like this light bulb comes on. Yes, yes. I, yeah, I was sitting on the 90 Mile Beach. Amazing. Yeah, so um, just out of Lakes Entrance on Eastern Beach, which is a really raw beach. It, it gets the full force of all the, the southwesterly winds and, you know, the, the only thing between uh, that beach and, and Antarctica is Tasmania, many, many thousands of miles away or kilometres away. So it, it's really rough and raw, but beautiful. And I remember sitting down at one point and thinking I might just sit for a while. And I, and I remember the sun sort of warming my skin and um, being able to smell the beach, to actually smell the sea air and thinking, wow, this is just beautiful. And doing that for a few, a few times uh, in a row and I started to reflect and think, this is actually doing me really a lot of good. I could feel it actually invigorating me. So, yeah, I know exactly where I was. Did you have other moments during that sort of time of, uh, yeah, I'm going a sabbatical, you, you may, may have another term for it, but d- during that time, other sorts of moments like that, maybe not about the, you know, walking, but other things in your life where you went, oh, actually, work-wise, personal, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So, so work-wise, obviously, I was following what was going on and thinking, oh, my goodness, this is not going well at all. And I knew roughly the direction that things would go but of course the devil's always in the detail and as the detail was coming out I was seeing all sorts of reactions to that and you know people reaching out to me saying what are you doing what are you doing when are you coming back and and <laughs> we need you back <laughs> yeah, and being able well and you know I was able to say to people well you know what actually there's not a lot I can do to help you at the moment because the rest of the policy hasn't dropped you need to wait until it's all there And then we need to work through sensible ways of surviving for in the short term before you can thrive. So, so I was quite relaxed and able to distance myself from it, which is not something I'd been able to do before, Rob. You know, normally I'd be in there and wanting to fix it. Well, I was quite prepared to sit back and just wait um, because. I think if you're going to take on an ambition to fix things, if your solution's focused, and that's sort of how I am, I think you can't just whinge and complain. You actually have to have some thinking around solutions or alternatives. And I think that's where our sector is at now. Yeah, There's been a lot of complaining and... Quite rightly, and a lot of analysis done on the mistakes and the oversights and, I guess, 
you know, the lack of um, modelling or whatever and flaws in formulas and whatever. But at the end of the day, pick, pointing those out, yes, okay, but what we should be really concentrating on is how do we move forward mm. as a sector? And I guess one of my biggest frustrations with our sector is that we've never been able to speak as one voice. Yes. Mm. And I think that actually works against us. And I've seen it within government. Our inability to talk as one voice is actually exploited yeah. because it enables divide and conquer. Yeah. And you can sort of see that as this has unfolded over the last 12 months. And of course, this maybe dates this uh, this conversation a little bit, but I think that's okay because this feels like a kind of important moment. But but you sort of see that when things are coming out, you're like, oh, I can see how that's been, inverted commas, played yeah. on the, by, in a political sense. And that's right. And, and as much as the here and now does date this conversation, yeah. we could have this exact conversation about COVID. 100%. Right? And, and we'll probably we, have it in 10 years' time, right? Like, same and thing. do you remember yeah. the perfect storm? Yeah. Back in the early noughties. You know, it was exactly the same. Oh, sorry, it was uh, 2009, 10 and all of that. Exactly the same. We were unable to come together with one voice. And I think the other thing that we haven't done well, and maybe we all need to go and spend time on the 90-mile beach to achieve this, <laughs> is that bit of reflection where we can be honest with ourselves and look at things that we could do better and truly invest our time and effort into improving those things. I think we tend to get carried away. We had the recovery coming out of COVID and it was significant. You know, it was that V-shaped uh, recovery and that's great, but um, it just meant that all the lessons that we should have learned we sort of put them aside and, oh, good, we're back and, and we're on again and we're running and we're running and, oh, no, we're not, not anymore. Given your, like, with, with the benefit of your experience, if you could wave a magic wand and suddenly elevate, you know, what we do in this industry to where, I mean, I think most of us feel like it probably should sit in terms of national discourse, the contributions to culture, society, economy, of course, as well. You know, what do you think you would do if you waved your magic wands and suddenly everything was fine? What would that look like? I think where we have made the biggest mistake <laughs> is on uh, ignoring social licence mm. for too long. Um, we know, look, I, I mean, I've been working in this for 35 years. My family still don't understand what I do. And I was pretty shocked recently when I was having a fairly frank discussion with my family members, you know, wider family members about international students and migration and so on. And they started to say things like, well, it's not so bad because, you know, at least more domestic students will get places now. And I'm saying, oh, really? Do you really think really? that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And these are people who I thought I had been influencing in a mm. positive way who were completely ignorant. And so the average Joe citizen mm. really does not understand the whole sector. I don't think they value our universities the way they should. They're quite happy to have the medical advancements and be beneficiaries of that, but they don't make the connection between that and the universities mm. and funding for higher education and the work of academics and so on. So, I, yeah, social licence is, is seriously been overlooked, has been overlooked by us, and it's not just about international students and international education and all the benefits it brings to Australia. It's about higher education more broadly. And, yeah, I think we've, we haven't done a good job with that. Over the years, you've, you've served in senior positions, all parts of this industry. I mean, you've mentioned Austria, but of course, you've been in institutions. You've consulted as well. So you've actually seen all of these different sides of the sector. Has there been an element or one of those roles, one of those approaches, if you like, that you've enjoyed the most or that you feel fits you best? Yeah, good question. Yeah, I have had a lot of experience um, and I guess I've been... Pretty lucky. In the early days of international education, 
we were learning as we were mm. we're going and with that came opportunities you know like um at monash doing all sorts of things like um exploring what a pathways college which became monash college <laughs> would look like and exploring um offshore campuses such as monash malaysia and wow, and, yeah, and yeah. getting involved in all of that was really really amazing but do you know it's interesting because when I went to JCU, James Cook, I really didn't think I would learn much. I was sort of at the point where I thought, well, I've kind of been there, done that. There's probably not a lot I will learn, but I'm really happy to be able to come and share some of my experience and hopefully help out a regional, a good quality university, you know, have some success in international education. But when I got there, I actually learnt a lot. And I think the big difference for me, was the realisation of the importance of community with regional universities and regional centres and just how pivotal the university is to the entire community and that really the success of the university totally hinges on the success of the community and they are symbiotically connected. And so I, I think probably if I was to reflect back, at the time it was tough, but I did enjoy that element of my work that I had never really appreciated. It's kind of that third mission bit of a university. And when you're sort of in a busy city or urban university, I guess your connection with community is not as strong. It's definitely not as strong as what it becomes in regional centres. And I found that, I found it challenging but equally, I found it incredibly rewarding and enjoyable. Once I sort of came to the realisation, I had to get there pretty quickly, um, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that I needed to really bring the community along with me yeah. and how important the university was to the community. Once I got made that, that connection, I thought, right, I've got to change the way I do things. And I learn a lot. I, I feel richer for it. It's this thing about leadership, isn't it? Like from when you when you sort of look up to industry leaders, we sort of we sort of think, oh, they kind of know everything and every you know. It's <laughs> but but it's so true. It's so human that we're always learning as we as we go along. I mean, in your case, having served in so many different leadership positions, do you have any kind of general reflections on maybe things that really work well broadly, but also things that we should probably be doing better? Yeah. Right. Well, for me personally, I came from quite humble beginnings, you know, like I didn't walk into management roles or anything like that. In fact, (laughs) my very first job, you'll love this, Rob, I was actually due to go abroad uh, for travel, you know, a bit of a gap year or whatever. I'd not long been out of uni and a family friend was working at RMIT TechniSearch and that in the day was... The, in, the first international office at RMIT. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so this family friend rings up my mum and they're just chatting away and, well, um, and she's through all my brothers and sisters and what are they up to and what are they doing and da-da-da. And she comes to me and, and my mum says, well, Melissa's going abroad and she's, you know, just sort of hanging around, uh, doing a little bit of casual work, getting a bit of money together. And Sandra says, well, send her in to me. I'll keep her busy. I've got plenty for her to do. So, so I get sent into RMIT TechniSearch, and there I was filling out AA forms. Now, if people actually know what an AA form is, that means they've been in the sector about 30 years or more because that's the old ECOE. Yeah, and they wow. were in triplicate or whatever, wow. and they were hand hand filled, and we had a filing system with a small exercise book where we actually created file numbers for all the students. And so if we lost the book, we were in big trouble. (laughs) But everything was paper-based and it all went into these paper files, including these AA forms. I mean, so what was the next step after that? So that's that's awesome. Like, it's such a great international... It's a humble beginning, (laughs) right? Humble beginning, that's right. But I I absolutely (laughs) loved what I was doing. And in fact, I loved it so much, I didn't go overseas. Oh, wow. Yeah, I got convinced to stay and... I guess um, I've always just had a go, Rob, and I think this is really important for women to think about 
is we tend to underestimate our ability and we undersell ourselves. We definitely undersell ourselves and we're always worried about being imposters. And and so I guess I just had a go. What have I got to lose? Uh, I was going to go overseas anyway, so I just had a go at stuff. And eventually um, I ended up uh, the marketing services manager in RMIT, which meant I dealt with the agents and chased things for them. So if there were offer letters that were outstanding and whatever. And I think that's been true of everything I've done. You know, I didn't get on project groups to set up Monash Malaysia and Monash College and things like that by just sitting around and, and not putting my hand up or just having a go. I guess... I probably said yes too much, but I don't regret any of that. I think just having a go. The other thing I would say is contributing. So at the time, you know, when you're young and you've got a young family and you're trying to to do so much and squeeze more and more into a day, to take on a voluntary role or anything to support the sector or to help other organisations out by taking some time aside and contributing your your support for that. It's hard at the time, but it comes back in spades. And I think it comes back because you feel better that you've contributed to the success of something. And so you get that sort of instant gratification. But I think longer term, you really do, the world opens up even further when you contribute back. So yeah, I think In terms of advice, I would encourage everyone to have a go, but also contribute back through things like IEAA. Mm. Put your hand up to be a board member. Why not? And, you know, even other associations support students, support local community groups. You know, I've always been on boards and and other things. I think I I did 13 years on the school council because I've got two two kids and there's a (laughs) seven-year gap. So one finished and the next one started and they've gone, right, you're still here, good. (laughs) We'll keep you on the school council. So 13 years I did that. I'm in the middle of that journey right now. (laughs) Yes, exactly. But it's important. It is, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah. because, you know, you need these organisations to be successful for your kids in the case of the school council and in the community and for, for us in our professional lives. We want our institutions and our sector to be successful. So you've got to contribute beyond just what you do in your day job. That really resonates with me because when you are involved, like obviously you're making your contribution and but you don't really know where it's going to be. People notice that, don't they? Like they notice it when you're doing things and you're yeah. active and, and you know I don't think they notice I don't think you feel that they notice that at the Sorry, time. Yeah, this is what yeah. I mean. Yeah. But you, over a long enough period when yes. you when you're a giver. Yeah. Uh, you know, to start with, you, you know, you might just be on a volunteering for the Young Professionals Association. Yeah. And people might see your name and say, oh, okay, yeah, so and so. And they don't really, that might not register. But when you do that year after year after year after year after year, suddenly that just mental availability in people's minds, that's a massive factor long term. Yeah, you, you definitely get some visibility through that. Yeah. But, you know, the opportunities sort of broaden and, you know, you, you, you're sort of there and, People start to associate you with certain things. And, you know, if you want something done, Rob, you go to a busy person, don't you? <laughs> That's so true. And so, so if you're busy, there's a very good chance you're going to get busier. But, but, you know, in the longer term, I think that's a good thing. Yes, like say yes to stuff when it comes yes. up. It's actually interesting because I, I heard that advice early in my career, like, oh, you know, say yes to, to everything, but then nothing was being offered to me. Yeah. So that's where like, this kind of other bit of advice is so yeah. critical. It's like, well... You're not going to get offered things unless you're kind of going out and and offering yourself to to contribute. Yep, you've got to show an interest. Show an interest and then that sort of starts to drive things forward over time. Yep, definitely. Yeah. Well worth it. Effective content in international education is about consistency, quality and clarity. It tells a story that connects in a format that works with your channels. Talk to the team at Insider, an award-winning creative agency focused on international education. Visit insiderstudios.com.au for more. Where's been the most interesting or unusual or surprising place that you've been in all of your travels? Mm. Maybe a place where you stepped off the plane and just went, oh, this is just, I'm out of my out of my depth here. Oh, now you're you're asking me to remember stuff. (laughs) (laughs) And this old brain. (laughs) 
<laughs> struggles with that. There are parts of China that have really fascinated me. Yeah. We stayed one time in a, a very ancient village. I think it was Yunnan province, I'm thinking, and it was quite a treat. Another time we climbed the snow mountain and that was really quite special. Where's that? That's also Again, China. yeah, in China. But I've also been to Laos, Vientiane, took my family there. And, you know, that was amazing. We went for a walk in the markets on a Saturday morning or something. It was just, we were just strolling along. We had kids in prams, whatever. And there was a lot of military paraphernalia, you know, like military umbrellas. There were he- helmets and... Uh, uniforms. Uniforms and yeah. all that sort of stuff. And you would see... Shells, you know, bombshells and, and that sort of stuff, landmine type remnants. And, and we were sort of fascinated to see all of that. And it wasn't until later when I read up a little bit more to understand that I realised that Laos had the claim to fame of being the most bombed nation uh, in the world. Is that uh, right? Yeah, because during the Vietnam War, the planes would fly over the top. And, yeah, it was kind of... No GPS back then. No. And it was in the middle of everything. And although it wasn't party to necessarily the war, but it was, I guess, Indochina back back around that time. So the borders were slightly different. But that area had that claim to fame. So it wasn't spectacular to look at, but it was a bit of a, a reminder. Oh, wow. You know, this this is something that we're seeing in this day and age that this nation has has survived and had to cope with. So I guess that was a sort of, you know, stop and check moment and realise just how lucky we are in Australia to have avoided all of that. Yeah, we are, aren't we? Mm. I reflect on that often, just how lucky we are. I mean, we've got the moat, right? We've got this big moat around us. Which is uh, which is a blessing and a curse in in some ways. Yes, you, you, you might we are say. an island, yeah, isolated. But I'm, I'm fascinated when you run into those moments in history. As, as you're talking, I just it brought back a memory for me of being in Myanmar, you know, twenty plus years ago, and being off in this little village and finding in this little hut on the side of the road a coin from the British. East India Company. Yeah, wow. I bought it because I was just like, holy smokes, this is like history. history. And obviously that's just stuff's kind of circulating out in there. But but that is the history of these places. And yes. you get these flavours and these little glimpses back in time. Mm-hmm. And that's the life and experience of these people. It's amazing. And I can remember staying in a longhouse in East Malaysia. I think we were somewhere near Kuching, up mm-hmm. in the hills. And we, yeah, we stayed in a longhouse there. And there were the shrunken heads uh, oh, wow. yeah, from soldiers that they'd captured during the war. And, yes, they were, they were all hanging up and part of the decoration, really. Uh, and then other parts, we went, we stayed in Mulu and we did the walk to the caves. And at a particular time in the day, these bats... These little small bats, fruit bats, I guess they are, they swirl out of the top of the caves and they're really quite amazing to watch. Uh, But in this ecotourism lodgings, there was a, a moth and it was the size of a bird and it was on one of the pillars and we were just looking at it and it was mesmerizing. It was beautiful and just the markings on it were just. Incredible! It's something I, I you would never see anywhere else. You've obviously had many travel experiences to some incredible places, but I guess during your sabbatical, you probably had some time to reflect on other places you want to go. <laughs> right? I tell you what, I'm I'm not in a hurry to get on a plane. Is that right? Yeah, truly, truly, I'm quite happy to do a road trip right now. Yeah. I, I think I've um, I, th- I think I'm planed out. Mm. I'm happy to just. Jump in the car, um, listen to the radio, um, particularly the local radio stations, and get a bit of a sense of what's the conversation in this part of Australia. And ru- rural and regional Australia at the moment is a place I'm happy to spend a bit more time in. Why? Why the fascination? Yeah, I think um, it's just community. It's the local communities and how how they operate. 
there's a lot of there's a lot of stories out there if you want to listen and people are happy to talk to you about them and I think they're just sort of grounding conversations that make you realize how atypical my life has been with all this travel and you know the having the benefit of being into many many destinations around the world and that's not normal not everyone gets that in Australia and so I think getting insights into the regular person's life and their stories is really, really interesting. What, what do you reckon 15 or 16-year-old Melissa, Melissa Banks would have made of where you are now and all these adventures? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I probably would have mucked it up if I had a plan. <laughs> if I'd been able to see now where I am and, where, and as a 16-year-old, I probably would have been too deliberate of trying to get mm. there because I don't think I'd change anything. I'd still want to be who I am, but I'm pleased that I didn't have a hard plan to get there, that I've stepped sideways and crossways and up and down and, and just had a go at everything, really. And I think if I'd had more of a plan, I probably would have passed up those opportunities. I'm glad I couldn't see that. When COVID happened and we closed our business, one of the things that I realised in that experience was we only had, we like doors were closed on us. And, and in fact, it made me suddenly realise that one of the most important things you can have, and life is okay when there are several doors open for you to choose from. And, and we were suddenly in this situation where everything was closed to us. Uh, and what happened in, in our case was like we, we had a caravan and, and, uh, and a four-wheel drive and the border to Queensland opened that door opened and we went through but it was the only one that was open at that point when you're looking at opportunities in front of you and there are maybe several doors open how have you made that decision about yeah. which one to walk through yeah i think for me it's it's got to interest me and it's got to be something that aligns with my values so you know before when i mentioned my decision to finish at Austrade was aligned, was largely driven by my values because I could see what was coming. I really didn't want to be part of it and I knew I couldn't defend it. (laughs) So it was just easier to just know I'm not going to be part of that. I don't want to be associated with that. So for me, you know, if there's several doors open, you know, some of them might be a fast track to senior management or whatever or better pay. But if it doesn't uh, energise me in the process and enrich me and if I don't feel as though I'm a, making a difference I won't do it. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you've you know you've had it's, it seems like everything's been closed to you or if you've oh been, yeah. yeah 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 I mean there are times where you think oh where's this going you know, this is a bit boring now I, I probably need to do something else I don't have a long attention span Rob <laughs> don't stay long in <laughs> positions. In fact, the longest I've ever been employed by anyone is by myself. Yeah, right. So I must be a pretty good boss, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, after sort of three years, if I'm starting to get a feel a bit stale or, you know, not, I'm not leaping out of bed, I know I've got to start thinking about something else. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And so in that sort of situation, is that, the, is that where you're just looking for what opportunities might be out there? Do you, do you actively talk, start talking to people or is it just when stuff starts coming to you that you realise that it's time and something's drawing you in that direction? Yeah, pretty much the latter. Yeah. Um, so I don't go actively out to pursue things. Um, I did actively make a decision to join the IEAA board um, and, and that was because I, I felt that you know, I had something to contribute and I wanted to. I wanted to contribute time and energy into that for the for the good of the sector. So I guess that one was a, a deliberate decision. But most of the others, no, I, I wouldn't say I've gone out seeking them. Mm. Bit, bit of a left turn. My brain's kind of gone back to when you were talking about taking your kids, you know, into, into Laos. Have they picked up the, the sort of some some travel bug or something like that? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, one of them uh, at during her undergraduate studies did two study abroad experiences where she ended up in very rural parts of um, Nepal and also in China for, you know, sort of four weeks or I think one of them was for about three months. So she definitely is a traveller. 
The other one, not so much. So, yet. I think she's she's younger, so we'll see where she goes. But she's interesting. She's kind of a bit like the new student, the new domestic student who has not done the traditional finish year 12, go into undergraduate studies. She's credential collecting. Yeah, very interesting. So she's on to her third vet qualification and she hasn't had to pay for one of them, Rob. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So she, unlike my older daughter, is going to end up with, if any, hex debt. It'll be a small hex debt. So she's really shrewd. <laughs> but the qualifications that she's collecting each build upon each other and they're going to give her portability. She can literally pick them up and do it anywhere in the world. So hopefully that's that all that exposure to different cultures and different opportunities, hopefully that's influencing her decision-making around her education opportunities and her interests and, and how she leverages them for her opportunities. What elements of yourself do you, do you now see in your kids? Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, the reason I ask, uh, just give you a moment to think about it. Like, I'm now fascinated by that. My kids are just kind of reaching that age where I'm just kind of like, oh, crap, like, I, I do that. <laughs> you know? and, and elements of And, of course, they have their own characteristics and flavours and environment as it fed into it. But I'm starting to go, oh, gosh. You oh, know, isn't it I'm funny? Yeah. I can remember when I was a young mum saying things and thinking, oh, my God, my mum used to say that to me. <laughs> And so, I, uh, yeah, you do see yourself in your kids. I think they're pretty adventurous, so they'll have a go at things. They're achievers, so both of them have been um, serious competitive swimmers competing at state and national levels. You know, that means they've got to be disciplined. Anyone that's ever done any comp- level of competitive swimming knows that it's the early mornings and many, many hours in the pool. So, yeah, they, they have a go at that sort of stuff. Competitive, when you're competing, you know, you are testing yourself and you're putting yourself out there. So, yeah, I think they I don't know, I hopefully I haven't push them into any of that stuff they certainly enjoyed it and yeah I think their adventurism independence uh, I think they're pretty independent thinkers they don't just go along with what's sort of you know happening they'll often sort of chart their own course a bit so hopefully (laughs) hopefully that's um, some of my influence on them Mm. and coming back to you then Having, I'm just sort of thinking of you sitting on that beach, on 90 Mile Beach, looking out at the ocean, you know, the wild ocean and the wind blowing. Like, what's next for you then? For somebody who's achieved so much and contributed so much to this industry, and I'm not asking you know, which company you're going to, no, but no. Do, do you have a feel about, you know, what else you want to do next? I would really like to contribute to the conversation about solutions Mm. right now. So in the here and now, I think um, the conversation needs to switch towards solutions and sustainability. Now, the government is right about that. We we do need to think about longer-term sustainability. I think some of us have to ask ourselves some pretty tough questions around how much money is too much? You know, how many students is too much? And, you know, what does the University of the Future look like? Because I think there are changes afoot and we need to adjust. I think contributing to the longer term sustainability of the sector and perhaps contributing to the shape of that in all the right ways. So I think probably having some of those tough conversations is probably what's ahead of us. And I'm up for that. Awesome. That sounds so much like the the kind of calm, wise voice of experience, right? Because, you know, you've seen these these kind of crises. For those people who are relatively new to this, where does this sort of fit in the spectrum of, of the big bumps that we've had in the last 30 years in our sector? This is pretty significant. I think this is going, well, I hope... It's going to drive structural change. Yes. Yeah. And I think it needs to. I think the sector does need to to really reflect and adjust and not just adjust so that we, you know, exist. I think we need to look at that sustainability and think about the harder aspects of international education. We need to be more attuned 
to the student experience, student success and as I mentioned earlier, social licence, that really does need serious attention from all of us. We've all got a role we can play in that as well as, you know, organise all of us as one voice back into the community. I think every single one of us also can play a role in that. It's an opportunity, isn't it? It is. um, To to actually deliberately, meticulously now design what the future... Yeah, but we've got to commit, Rob. Yeah, yes, it's true. Because we have seen these crises before. Yeah. You know, go back to the perfect storm, 2008, 9, 10, around about the global financial crisis, all of that. I mean, you know, it was a collision of a whole lot of factors that created that perfect storm, particularly in Melbourne. And... Just, you know, just for people who haven't who, who haven't heard of that and aren't aware of what that is, can you just give me the, the 10 second or 30 second yeah. summary of what happened? Well, you period? know, it was during the GFC, yeah. so already there was great, great uncertainty in the world economy, and so that disrupted patterns. But then we also had changes made to student and migration policy that impacted very quickly. And then we had violent student attacks, but in in Melbourne in particular, because there were a whole lot of students arriving, wanting to enrol in programs such as cookery or chef or hairdressing or whatever, that were on the skilled migrations list. And they were arriving because they wanted to migrate, but they were using the student visa Mm. as an avenue towards migration. And... I'm not suggesting in any way here that our graduates don't make great migrants and great citizens of Australia. They absolutely do. But if they want to migrate, then the pathway to migration might involve education, but you shouldn't be using the student visa as the primary driver, uh, driver, yeah, yeah, you know, avenue to achieve migration because it means they're not serious students and we do want serious students. We had lots of students coming uh, motivated by migration, not by study. We're living in really poor conditions, further and further away from their study institute and travelling late at night on public transport. So they were exposing themselves to, you know, dangerous circumstances. I mean, I wouldn't catch the train in Melbourne at 11.30 at night on my own. So, And this is the sort of stuff that they were doing. That situation then resulted in um, violent student attacks. There was a lot of media around demand for infrastructure so people couldn't get seats on buses and trains in Melbourne. Accommodation was tight, jobs were tight and it was all uh, blamed on international students. And so next thing we know, we're getting Indian students beaten up in the streets. It was a really dark time for Victoria and other parts of Australia. But, yeah, I think we need to learn from those things. And we don't always learn. No, we don't always learn, unfortunately. We're very quick to forget, actually, because we do bounce back. And we will bounce back from this. But can we bounce back better? Well, that's what we said after COVID. Mm. Build back better. Well, have have we got any better? I don't know that we have. Mm. Interesting. Last question, just conscious of running running close to time. It's been so much fun. <laughs> Thank you. So um, this just feels like just the beginning for me. This is a, the only problem with doing a podcast. Once you get, get into a good convo, I'm just like, oh, we're getting close to an hour. Can we, go, can we have another one? <laughs> um, for somebody that's thinking about taking that time out, you know, taking a, a career break, whatever point they're up to in their career, but hesitating. Oh, don't. I highly recommend a bit of a... Well, I I called it initially a long summer because I was kind of expecting to get through from November through to about March, maybe start to emerge after Easter, you know, April or whatever. But then, you know, the policy context was such that it wasn't worth coming back. I didn't want to go back into that great uncertainty. I needed to wait until policy dropped and we, we had some clarity around exactly how this was all going to work caps and other things and um, you know ministerial direction 107 all that sort of stuff we needed much greater clarity around that but I would highly recommend it if you can and maybe you know obviously financially it's not easy I still can't access my super sadly <laughs> um, but 
And, and maybe you won't be able to either and other people won't be able to either, but taking a bit of a break and even if you go and do part-time work, I don't know, in a cafe or um, cleaning or something that enables you to just take a break, draw breath, do a bit of reflection, reflect self-reflection as well as reflection on the sector and is this really what I want to do? What really interests me? Is there something I'd, I, I would love to be able to have a go at? And just, you know, to reset. I think it's a real reset. D- did you have to hold yourself back at times, though? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking of the Melissa Banks I know. Yes. I'm just thinking there must have been moments where you're, you're just like, Let Oh, me yes. This. There were times where I said to my husband, I'm going to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not looking at LinkedIn anymore. <laughs> and look, that is, that's actually a really good lesson. Like, sometimes you just got to cut that stuff off. Yeah, put and, it down. And it takes time, doesn't it? It takes time for your brain to unwind yes. from... The things that we're always thinking about work-wise, career, contributions and everything. And it's not until you actually have that moment where you've done that repeatedly day after day, week after week, that suddenly like you can just, so, excuse the language, but just chill the fuck out a little bit, you know. <laughs> That's exactly right. But you've got to have space to do that. Yeah. You've got to give yourself space to just chill the fuck out (laughs) and when you're busy and you're working full-time and you've got staff and and you've got reporting and and committees and and whatever it's hard to find that time to just get that chill and you know the current environment makes it extra hard to chill because you're constantly worrying but you know taking time out to to chill actually enables you to unpack Mm. all these really complex policies and and the political scenarios. And I think you can cope better when you're able to make a little bit of sense of them and unpack them so that you can repack your your way out or your strategy to go forward. As you're talking, I I almost see that as like the almost like the growth curve of the international education, right? Like you're contributing, you've got this thing and then, you know, of course you take a break. So, you know, you're, you're you're in this sort of dip, so to speak, but this is the moment where you're re-energising and you're getting clarity on things and you're seeing things from a distance and you almost need those moments just for the, you know, to recover because then when you're ready to step back in, you, you're ready to go again. And that's right. And, it's, and, you know, some people have worked really hard for years and years, Rob. You know, they were all working really hard up to COVID because there were opportunities and we were growing and it was, everything was great. But still hard work, right? And then we go into COVID. And wow, I mean, that just disrupted absolutely everything. And we were dealing with completely different scenarios. And, you know, students who were stranded, our students, Australian students who were stranded offshore. We had international students onshore who were stranded as well. And then we went into lockdown. And, uh, I mean, it was just crazy. It was chaotic. And... There was, um, coming out of that, we had the very quick rebound. So, of course, we're busy again. (laughs) Now we've got this situation where we're still busy, but we're trying to cope with a very changing environment. And so I think there are some people out there that really do need a break. And I hope they take a chance to be kind to themselves and give themselves that break. I hope they get a break, Melissa, but I'm also super glad that you're back. <laughs> we need you right now. And it's been awesome chatting with you. With Thanks, you on Rob. Global Great Horizons. to catch up as always. as always. Thanks, Abe. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to the Global Society, globalsociety.com.au. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.